Okay. So I think it's good that we check that we're all connected to the rest of the people. Can we hear each other from all the places? So let's start with, because uh, I can't see anything. Uh, let's start with the uh, Prizren, which we talked to earlier. Prizren, hi. Yeah. <laughs> Very loud, <laughs> All right, it's great to hear from you. Uh, anyway, just I should remind you: don't forget to vote, and we'll start with the conversation. We'll continue with the conversation from here on. Uh, would we hear uh, Belgrade? Is Belgrade online? Can you hear us, Belgrade? Offline. Oh, okay. So we go to Ljubljana. Can we hear Ljubljana? Was that? Okay. Which one is on? <laughs> Zagreb. Zagreb. Hi, Zagreb. Hi. So we've got Zagreb online. Fantastic. Okay. Um, who else is online? Podgorica? Yay! Angelka, I think it's, I hear your voice. <laughs> there we can on the computer. Oh, that's the thing. So, Gorian, if you can turn the computer a little bit towards us, then the whole thing will be much better. Yeah. <laughs> Belgrade is there as well. Okay. Anna, offline, back up. Anyway, we're all connected. The Balkan is finally, you know, united in one uh, <laughs> one discussion. <laughs> and we'll, 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 we'll get your questions. But we're not going to put the blood in for every question. We're going to uh, lose too much time. We'll just uh, continue uh, the conversation where we stop. But first of all, the point on off in every city. Well, technology is perfect, but you know, what can we do? <laughs> anyway, thanks again for having um, like a, a one day off to come here and plug into to, to, to the Balkans. And thank you most of all to make this film, which uh, I'm sure we all kind of... Uh, Need, you know, in one way or the other. Um, the, the the thing, the thing is not just uh, that that you are you are um, making a, um, an, a a film to to raise the issue. I also think that like creatively, you have to be very you have to be very witty to to dare uh, and go on this road trip for six years and live with it, not only while shooting it. You know, but also afterwards, and uh, and uh, see how people perceived it, and how um, perhaps they even attack you for it, or or you know, or you know, raise different issues which uh, are kind of ethically always on the on the edge. Um, but I um, mean, you know, I've seen previous films of yours. You're quite witty with. Walking on the on the very kind of thin line between between what you've seen and what you've experienced and what you put in your film. So I mean, I, I imagine you do this in the editing mostly while you're doing films. You're just surviving it, or no? No. Um, well, hi again. Uh, no, I, <laughs> films, of course, are written, so to say, also in editing, but. Uh, uh, this film specifically is a very conceptual film, actually. Uh, part of the concept was to build a means of transport, which is uh, like this kind of spaceship, small one. Uh, so we built it for the film. It was part of the concept. Uh, also part of the concept was that it looks ridiculous and stupid. So we would come to places that people can, you know, laugh at us and, and we can have a connection because of that. Um, also, it was a concept that it was a provocation to the military world, 
because we were basically penetrating in a world which we should not be with this kind of thing, you know. You don't go with small airplanes to Libyan uh, air bases, you know, to Libyan air force <laughs> centers, you know. So we knew it was going to stir some, it was a provocation, but it was part of the concept. And a lot of things that happen as a consequence of this kind of idea as a basis were also uh, foreseeable. We knew it, we knew it, we would have trouble with the military. We knew we will have people uh, astonished and we came like a, a circus group in, into a village uh, where people have never seen an airplane and, and they would say what are you doing here and we would say the title of the film which is become as friends and uh, I think there's a phone ring and so um, so a lot of things you see are are let's say scenes that I had seen before you know I have seen by living in in Central Africa for for many many years, you know, I have seen many many times uh, uh, statesmen or ambassadors talking to tribal people, you know. So because I've seen it so many times, I knew in advance what they would say. So I think we were just talking about this before. Um, I knew what the investors would say. I know. I knew what the militaries would say. I knew more or less what the Chinese would say. You know, the Chinese said, "Like, well, we come as friends. All we want is the resources, and we don't want to harm everybody." Blaming us, me as a European, for having screwed up Africa, and I take the blame because I'm, you know, I I, I can take it. It's a part of the, the film too. Uh, I also used the momentum of a naive. Traveler, you know, and I when people say, "Well, you guys, you guys bring all the arms from France," um, I have two options. I can, as a filmmaker, I can say, "Yeah, of course I know. I know. I've even I made a film about it. It's called Darwin's Night." Or I can say, "Ah, oh, really? Uh, really?" And so, 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 and then so this, of course, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a way to, uh, in, uh, you know, engage with people, you know, and engage with this person's, let's say. Frequency, you know, the way he talks, I, I find very attractive and very interesting. He's very smart, but he's also a fool, you know. So, so he's this kind of Tostoyevsky figure, and and I, I have to kind of, you know, be in a flow with this person. Yeah, yeah, or understand. Yeah, maybe not always understand, but try to understand and and try to, you know, I, uh, you know, go with it, you know. So, so this is the work of this kind of filmmaking. Huh? With tribal people, it's another. It's another thing with the tribal people. I mean, it's, there's no real translation for what you're saying, right? Yeah. Well, again, with tribal people, it's, it is very problematic because really, that there comes a point when you really say, "What? Well, why am I here? What, what am I doing? Because I shouldn't be here. I should leave them alone." But of course, uh, I, I didn't come. Usually alone, I came in the shadow of the missionaries, you know, and I was trying to uh, see what are those people from my part of the world doing, and they're giving, you know, food and tennis socks to to people, and and I was like, wow, that's uh, that's important, you know, tennis socks, you know, <laughs> and so so my my I guess my. Uh, is the, yeah, but but the thing is, what you see in the movie is not you don't see only missionaries giving you know dresses to naked people. You see a guy behind the camera being you know freaking out and being astonished and and amazed and about what's happening. So what you see in these kind of films is not just this first layer of of let's say reality. But more important is like this, the second and third and fourth layer of reality, which is the psychology, psychological ground of of things, you know, and how you look at people and how you are fascinated by somebody. That translates into film. And if you, if you can see a woman singing "My Land, My Land," uh, you see somebody singing, but you can also feel the person behind the camera being fascinated by this moment. Uh, by the beauty of the moment or so. And you can also feel the fascination by a warlord who cannot sing, you know, 
who does forgets the words of the national anthem, you know. It's also from a fascination, you know. It's a different kind of fascination. It's, it's a terrifying fascination, you know. But I think my fascination for the for the beauty and for for you know what we can call maybe the grain of revolution or some kind of resistance, it's fantastic, you know, when you can feel that. But it's also fantastically interesting when you can feel the 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 pathology of, of hundreds of years of colonialism when somebody says we the black people are too stupid please come and take our land and help us with the tractors you know I mean how can somebody say that you know and when you say it when you hear it I think most people understand a lot of things like this suddenly because you suddenly you go like shit you know there's something really really terrifying going on you know because ultimately Everything you have seen in this film, I think uh, you knew it already. You, you you have seen it before. You have read about things like this. You have seen it in your own environment somehow, in, in, in some kind of translated way. But when it's when it's uh, formulated in a movie, it, it it's it's suddenly uh, it's like a you know it really it's kind of like a s s shortcut in your brain or some kind of. A, magical cocktail that makes your brain, you know, more creative and you kind of connect things that you already knew but you did never thought about the connections on time also. But I think most of all is is, the, uh, is empathy and fascination. I think that's the most uh, uh, most magical thing and, and because it can really, really be translated in film, I guess. So, so I should uh, go to the questions. Um, I don't know. Can we take a question f first of all from the audience here, or do we have other questions? TV is there, like a, a a line of questions? Is there any questions like immediate one? No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the question is, how different was the film from your initial idea? Like, what did you write as a treatment, and what was this? Where, Podgorica? Okay. Um, well, the initial idea was more uh, more of us as as strange white people in it, because because I knew the plane was going to be a part of the film and. And all the mis mishaps and all the problems we had, of course, as as uh, these strange white people in this context, were good scenes, you know. Because every time we had a problem, we were like, okay, we have a problem, but it's a good scene you know, for the film. And so my plan was in the beginning to use more of this, and then in the editing, I cut it out, and I left only the beginning of the film with, you know, Hubert as a pilot. Going on this trip, but then it's no longer there because you needed it in the beginning because I wanted you to understand the kind of nature of this trip. Trip, but uh, afterwards it's not important anymore. It's not. You know, it's not about Hubert in Africa. It's about something much, much more important and much, much bigger. So, so I had to take out a lot of scenes which I thought were fantastic and funny and uh, strange and. And uh, fantastic, you know, souvenir for us, uh, which uh, which are now in the in the trash can. So you, yeah. not there anymore. I, I had you to I cut my there. well it, behind the camera, but uh, yeah. So air Okay. Um, so do we have another one from here? There. Aha. Uh -huh, there's questions. Um, we already answered this. Aha, uh -huh, we were already there. Yeah. Because we answered questions when you were still watching. Yeah, because we had this little de delay. <laughs> ah. Oh, Lepire. Lepire. Okay. Um, well, um, who killed him? A, a human being with a Kalashnikov. And, uh, what killed him? That when there is people in in a in a in a bad situation, and and uh, and most men have guns, and uh, then 
there is a problem, and and this is the the fact. So if people just die all the time because there's there's conflict and there's people who try to have food, people try to find a young lady to have a gun. So I have a gun, I take a, a lady. I need, I'm hungry, I, need, I take a lady. If the brother is not agreeing, he, he's dead. You know, so it's it's just one of these, you know, millions millions of people who die in Africa. Uh, for for nothing, you know, for for fight for resources, fight for food, fight for cattle, for cows, you know, uh, water, or because they have to defend some kind of stupid pipeline for oil or or whatever, you know. So it can be anything. So Lipire, this person who died on that day when we were in that in that village, was just one more, and it, and I I didn't think it was uh, so necessary to go into detail. Who went what and why? It was just one more case, and I think that's uh, universal and it's understandable. I think uh, so. Yeah, and I didn't, I didn't, uh, uh, I didn't know so much more. I just knew there was trouble. I think the villagers they didn't exactly know what happened. It was just at night they were shooting, you know, and one of them died. And this was Lipire, you know. No. The question is, was he uh, behind the camera in the war scenes? He says no. No, I mean, the, the, the only parts I did not film in this whole film was when I'm in, in the picture, when you can see me, uh, obviously. Um, no, actually, not even that, because sometimes I just had it running when I was in Libya with this strange general with the baby game. I just had the camera running on the second on the seat of the co-pilot, and it was just running. So. There's nobody filming, just a camera. Um, um, and the, the archive, it was, uh, it was clearly marked in the film. This is archive made, shot by a soldier, filmed by a soldier. So I'm, I'm not uh, really not a film uh, maker who goes to places where people shoot. Uh, I'm, I'm completely, completely not interested in that. I, I have no desire and no interest in seeing people. Shooting their each other's brains out, I mean, no. So, and when you know, it's the work of maybe war reporters or something. But I, I'm not. You know, I'm a filmmaker. So. Yeah. So shall we go to another question? Yeah. I think this we already answered. Search them. I'm not making it up. Uh, it's a secret. We'll wait for it, and hopefully next time, you know, we'll be all connected at the same time when it's there. Yeah, my next film in Africa, I will, I will shoot in Australia. I think uh, so. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a secret. I like that. So I think you made a lot of people curious now. So well, make, mind your I step. Make, I make people <laughs> curious. <laughs> mm. So uh, what was? Yeah. The question is, what was the resolution of the old man, and uh, was he not aware that he was signing, what he was signing? Well, this this situation. First, to tell you the context. Uh, I, I do a lot of uh, uh, ground, grassroots research for my films. Uh, long, that's why it took me six years for this film. But in this case, this scene was researched by a, uh, by a group of people in, in the US. It's called the Oakland Institute. A woman called Anurada Mittal. It's a, you can go online, oaklandinstitute.com. Those people are specialized in land grabbing issues on the planet everywhere. And one of the cases they had found was this specific case of 600,000 acres being basically stolen through this stupid contract for 25,000 euros, dollars, by a company in Texas. So it was a, like a case study from, uh, from lawyers, actually, in the USA. And they had put that online, and uh, I found it, and uh, I knew that it was South Sudan, so I was tracking that place, and I was trying to find that person, etc. And I think most people know that this situation is a very, very repetitive situation in colonial history. 
It's like, for example, New York was sold for six guilders to a Dutch businessman from, you know, it's exactly, exactly the same situation. It, it's a hoax, it's a theft, it's a pirate. Someone has something against this. You know, someone was born. <laughs> yeah, someone from Texas. Is <laughs> so, so, so to finish your your question, is when I came to when I came to this very situation to this specific old man, I came with a group of uh, activists from South Sudan who had physically the contract, and I said, well, if when we find that man, we can just ask him what was happening, how it how is it possible, and so we found him after one week of find, searching. <laughs> flying around, uh, going to wrong places. We found him. We had the contract, and the thunderstorm was coming. So for in, in, in terms of filmmaking, a fantastic situation, because there was a lot of thing, excitement and a lot of things happening, and a lot of people said, uh, thought, thought that we are investors, actually. So it was actually dangerous for us, because they, they thought we were the people who wanted to, to buy the land. It was in the middle of the light. We, we are like foreigners, and they said, you guys, with your contract, we're going to kill you because you made this contract. We're like, no, 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 it's not our contract. You know, <laughs> it was very co complicated. But but we had our, our you know friends, and they could kind of explain the situation. And then we shot the scene, and the man. I think it's not completely clear if he was forced to sign it, or if he maybe got a little bit of a commission or something. I don't know. It doesn't matter. What matters is that it's a typical case. That happens all the time, and in every moment of history, until today, and it happens on and on and on and on. The, sec the second thing was when uh, I had filmed this, the BBC World Service in South Sudan also found the website from the Oakland Institute. The BBC World Radio went to the same place and made a a, a, a radio uh, show about exactly this case. And confronting the ministers, they went to this, you know, very different kind of work. You know, so they went to uh, ask him what happened. They went to see the minister. They went to see the, to the Ministry of Land, etc. And what happened is because the BBC was inquiring, the government said, "Okay, the we the, the contract is no longer valid." And uh, this old man is confused. It's his fault. Uh, he shouldn't have signed it. Blah blah blah. So the government was completely whitewashed by their own. You know, lies basically. Um, but the truth is that, of course, a week later, I'm sure there would be another contract and another minister and another, another chief. You know, basically taking their hands and going, sign, sign here. Here's your fingerprint if you don't if you don't know how to write whatever. You know, this is this is what King Leopold did, or, or Stanley in the Congo. Uh, and, and it's really, uh, for me, the scene was so important. Why? Because. In, in all those years of filming this film, I was researching so hard to find documents, photos, fiction films or documentary films about this situation. You know, because about Leopold, about Stanley, I could find nothing, no ar no archive. And I went to see um, uh, the author of the book called King Leopold's Ghost, uh, Adam Hoxha, who is in a, in a, it's a fantastic book, by the way, King Leopold's Ghost about the Congo and about the colonial history of the Congo. And even Adam Hochschild, he had, he had no idea. He, he didn't know. He said, I don't know if there is any archive. So I think your mother is calling. Yeah. <laughs> Just switch it off. Uh, um, so so the, funny, the crazy thing is that I had no trace of whatsoever, not even fiction film. And suddenly, I have a real situation in real time in front of my camera, and I, I, it was completely unbelievable for me, you know, that it happens, that it, that this situation happened. And of course, as a as a filmmaker, uh, you you cannot not influence reality because it was my initiative to go, it was my initiative to find the contract, it was, it was my initiative to ask those local NGO, uh, NGOs or grassroots, can you talk in your language with the village chief and ask him. What happened with this contract? So it's of course, in a way, it's not you don't like as a filmmaker 
walk blind into a village and see what you can film and then suddenly something happens. Sometimes you, when you, when you engage with somebody, when you say, can I talk to you, it's already interfering in this person's, of course, reality, you know. That's what it is. That's filmmaking. I think it's uh, for, you know, intelligent and visually uh, literate people, it's clear, this kind of situation, right? It's not, uh, I'm not coincidentally in the middle of the night, somebody comes up with a contract and says, uh, oh, by the way, can <laughs> can we talk about land grabbing, you know? So this was, in a way, uh, this situation, other situations not, but this very situation was, in a way, the outcome of, of, uh, of you know, active active filmmaking. But of course, it's it is still very factual and it's very true. And he really is that person. It was a real situation and it was really documentary. You know? So, yeah. Maybe we should try to to see the other places. Podgorica has a question. Okay, let's go to Podgorica. Is is, is New York still with us? <laughs> Podgorica has a question. Two shots you decided to delete that you regret now. So did you delete some shots and you regret them now, but they're not in the film? Well, I think no filmmaker ever deletes anything. You know, you just keep it, keep forever. it, and keep it there. <laughs> no, and I don't regret. No, I, I worked for two years on the on the editing, and I think this is the film I wanted to make. So. Yeah. Not everything can go in. So Podgorica, they're still. Um, a lot of um, okay, things I, there. Actually, okay, I will tell you one thing. I have one short answer. I, I do regret one thing. Is when I came to the local villages, when the missionaries from Texas came to bring the light and to bring clothes and uh, to bring the Bible and all these you know, good things, I, I realized that there was a mirror. There was something happening which is very, very similar by of course, uh, the Muezzin and the Muslim uh, you know, infiltration, Muslim colonization of the center of Africa. Uh, and I did not find that in this film. So I, I, there are actually uh, you know, people who have ha had money from Gaddafi to make uh, mosques, uh, who went with the Quran, who went to the local villages and said, you should not be naked, you have to wear clothes, you have to march in step. You have to read the Quran and you have to or follow orders. So it was exactly the same thing. It was exactly the same thing. And from the point of view of the, of the you know, uh, Toposa tribe, they they had there was no difference, no difference. Texas or Khartoum, same thing, same idiotic imposition of we come as friends and we want to change you guys the way that we think you should be. You know? And this is basically. A profound, you know, this is basically this is a profound crime. You know, this is this is like this is the history of Europe, by the way. You know, uh, and uh, if we, if we want or not, this is this is this is what we are living on. You know, so questions yeah. here from local question. I'll just yeah. zip up further the, the rest of the audience. So the question is um, about this girl's jewelry, which was tossed in the toilet, and you know, sort of kind of self-destruction of their own culture. Whether, uh, yeah. Destruction. It's destruction from from an, an idea again, which is exterior. You know, because the teacher, the teacher who says. You should not have those beats. Is is the result of a missionary school? It's not a tribal man anymore. He's somebody who has become 
uh, uh, a man of Jesus, you know. So, and because he's a man of Jesus, the the jewelry is for a twelve-year-old girl is an offense. It's a it's a sexual symbol in a way because the girl is twelve. She wants to be beautiful. It's an identity. It's she wants to be herself. She makes makes it herself. The beats are maybe the oldest uh, expression of human beings' identity. It's like when you look at uh, Lucy or this, uh, you know, you find one million year old uh, bones of, of human beings, you find this exactly same kind of things around the skeletons of people, you know? So it was, it's, it is as old as human beings almost. And, and then comes somebody and says, take it off, you know? Because you shouldn't be what you have been all the time. You shouldn't be a sexual being. You should not be free. You should march in step. You should learn how to wear clothes because when you have clothes, you can be a soldier and then uh, you can protect the, the oil pipeline. This is this is it, you know. It's it's, uh, yeah, it's so terrifying. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm laughing because I'm I've been through this too often and uh, uh, it's just too painful, you know. And I think uh, the I'm glad that you see it as a spectator, and I'm glad that you feel the pain. And I'm glad that the film can translate it because it's something that really we we have to come to terms with, uh, all to all of us, you know. The other thing we talked this afternoon is perception of the border, the straight line in Africa, which doesn't it functions only in Europe, although in Europe also we have problems with the borders, especially in the Balkans. But the perception of a straight line to to indigenous, um, I don't know, tribal people is is is, is uh, something that's yeah. not possible actually. So yeah, actually w one of the reasons why many reasons why I needed a plane to make this film. But one of the reasons why I needed a plane is to understand history from 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 space, so to say. Because uh, when you see a, a tribal village, you, it's, it's round and organic. And when you see uh, 15 trees in a line, it's, it's a missionary station or it's the governor's uh, government or something. It's, it's something, you know, from the outside. So geometry, uh, the square, uh, is winning over the circle. So this is, this is basically the, the bottom line, you know. And, and sometimes it's so clearly visible. You know? It's very clear. It's like you just see from above. You can see forms. You can say, okay, here is this tribe of people, and here is oil companies. It's, I mean, it's, you can see it from a uh, from the moon. I think you know, just by by the form of it. You know. But the tribes had also borders where they would meet, right? Well, technology, technology, what? The solar Bible is important because otherwise the word of God cannot be transmitted. You know? um, the solar Bible was one of the most fantastic things I've ever seen. And as I guess, it's a, uh, it's solar. It's directly from God. It's uh, it's uh, it's it touches your heart. You know, it's like, yeah, it it went straight to my heart. So I had to put it in the film. And uh, I was actually when when I heard this first, I was like, S solar Bible, what 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 what? <laughs> like, <laughs> And it was like, yeah, solar Bible, and then this switches is on it, it speaks. And actually, again, as like the technique of filmmaking is, is is not only to film the solar Bible, but it's to film how we, as a small film crew, we're going like, what? So this, you can feel. I think you can feel it. You know, it's like, what's going on? You know, it's like, what the fuck is going on? You know, so so this, it is a fantastic thing. You know, because it's a, you kind of experience life like a child almost. You know, when you're five and you see something new and you're like, wow. You know, I just saw something amazing, and, and there's two kids, and they're like, "Oh, me too! I saw it. What was that?" And you know, so it's kind of recognizing or or, or questioning life in a in a naive way uh, is, I think, the ground uh, substance of these kind of films. You know, 
It's like because of course you go to places where you you shouldn't really be and where you're not really allowed. It's not really it's a bit forbidden. So it's it's it's, a, it's I think I, I have a lot of uh, this childish kind of thing, you know, going on and and and, and flying in an airplane and <laughs> we're singing in the plane. And, uh, we we we're filming our, ourselves singing and making loopings and stuff, but uh, it's not in the film. But uh, but uh, and and one of the one of the dreams of of children, which is uh, I think a very uh, very fantastic and noble dream, is to oppose authority, oppose patriarchy. You know, so when you see a dictator or a man who is suppressing people who is, has a disregard to women or disregard to rights and, and, and values and you can screw with this person in a way with their film it's a, it's a victory you know? it's, a, it's a victory just like when you're 10 years old and you, you're in class and you don't like a teacher and you make you, I don't know, put a banana here uh, and he falls and everyone laughs and this is, it's a victory against authority, against blind authority Okay, banana is not a good example, but it's, uh, something more smart than banana. But uh, a smart joke or something. It is. He's. He's. Uh, yeah. Okay, it's my phone now. It's just, sorry. Fix mine. Finally. So we go to the another question. Let's see what uh, Zagreb doing because we've not heard Zagreb. Hey Zagreb. Hey, we see you. <laughs> is there a question coming from Zagreb? Ah, we can't hear each other. Oh, okay. So we have one from Prizren. Okay, let's go to Prizren. Can we hear Prizren? Can you comment? Uh huh. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, so the the question is uh, Europe with migration cri crisis and uh, um, the coming uh, well. Uh, well, it's a good question, actually. Uh, when I when I see watch television and I see a, a German uh, Austrian minister talking about the crisis, and when they say we will punish those, uh, you know, uh, people who bring the refugees over the border, they will put them in prison, we will solve the problem. I I I, I can just strangle this guy, you know. I can I cannot believe how how is it possible that our politicians dare to never go back to the source of the problem, you know? They always like go on the top of the problem. It's like there's a problem on the border. There are all these people who have to be fed. Who is, whose fault is it? The f it's the fault of those poor guys who got got some money and brought them over with with a boat or with a with a truck, you know? I mean, poor guys. They are criminals when they you know in in in, the, in the, of course in the proper sense, but this is not the problem. The problem is the source, and the problem is the source. And the source is hundreds of years of disregard, and patriarchic, and interference, and uh, colonialism. That that is the problem. And this movie, uh, we come as friends, is is a very simple <laughs> journey into the other direction, to the core of the problem. It's like when you when you screw up a place so much and for so long, and with so much blindness and 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 stupidity actually then this is what's happening and, and I think what we're seeing now in the, the crisis crisis with uh, refugees it's only the very beginning of a, of a long story where we're going to see the next 20 30 years and we're going to see like uh, unbelievably with so much more and so many more people are going to move because also because of uh, environmental destruction climate and climate change so but we have to start to start to go to the core of the questions and ask ourselves the real questions what is going on in uh, in, in, in the, the the grain of, of the problem yeah. so that's what I can say I and mean, I cannot you know in detail like I, I don't know so much uh, I must say I don't know so much I only see whatever one sees and reads is that there are you know hundreds of thousands of people on the run which, uh, yeah. Yeah. Once again. Oh, we should go to the results of the voting. Okay, so let's go through the results of the voting. Tell me. We'll, we'll go to... Uh-huh. 
that there were any particular negative reactions by the people that uh, you were open to me that the discrimination or especially with the dead guys or something like this? Did they at least realize what was going on? Learn something from it? Mm -hmm. Did the so called bad guys learn something from it on the on during this process of filmmaking, you mean? Did you have direct confrontations afterwards, or? Well, one of the problems of what you refer to as bad guys is that they they don't think they're bad guys. So, so I think that's already a, a definition is from the beginning a problem because everyone thinks they do the right thing. So, um, secondly, the consequence is that they probably don't want to let me in into their country anymore. Which is okay. I don't. I don't care. Um, um, and the third, uh, uh, maybe a consequence is that they will learn, and that's a terrifying consequence. They will learn to maybe not talk to people like Hubert anymore, and that's a terrifying thing because it's uh, it's basically cutting bridges. I I, I have this experience. I had it with Darwin's Nightmare. I was after Darwin's Nightmare, which was a film about gun running. Uh, under threat, I had lawsuits and death threats and uh, three years of, of terrifying fight. But even people who were trying to make films after that in, in Tanzania where I shot uh, Darwin's Nightmare were arrested just because they had a camera. You know? They were just near some kind of uh, airport. They were arrested. And I knew a lot of cases. So that's, that's one of the really uh, horrifying effects of films. So if you ask me if films change the world, yes. <laughs> but you don't know which way. Uh, so we just conclude this talk, I think. I wanted to ask you about the mosquitoes, but let's go to the final uh, conclusions of the vote so we can hear the rest of the people. So who is online? Tell me. Hit. Uh -huh. So let's go to... One, two. Out of ten. Aha, uh -huh, Ljubljana, out of five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very well. 4.65, Zagreb, 4.4, Belgrade, 4.3, Podgorica, 4, Skopje, 4.8, Prizren, 3.6. Okay, so we got the whole picture. So, so we're leading over Donald Trump? Or is it the next same? screening? <laughs> but yeah, I was. Like What's wrong with the I people in print? Fuck, fuck, fuck you, fuck you guys. I would think we'd like, we like to hear something if we can if we can plug into to them. No? Can we can we hear? Can we at least hear? It's huh? No? No. Oh, okay. Okay. There's that. My last question, and then really, is the. You know, the animal I hated so far, and it's the animal who's deadly and killed so many people uh, in Africa, now finally became a friend as well, because you you t told me something precious today, so I, if you can share that. How about the mosquitoes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mosquitoes are interesting animals. Uh, they, there's the Gates Foundation puts millions and millions and millions into fighting uh, malaria carried by mosquitoes. I, I personally died almost twice from malaria in my, in my 20 years in Africa. But actually this animal is, is a fantastically, uh, it's kind of a, sa a savior of the rainforest because uh, only because of mosquitoes and malaria the, the Congo is still a rainforest because it, if the Europeans would not have had this problem, they would have chopped it down 100 years ago. And uh, so it's actually a very ecological animal. So I, I thank the, all the mosquitoes on the planet for being around and for keeping biting, 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 chop down. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Hubert. This was really great to have you here. <laughs> Thank you also all the rest of the city. Um, this was like the first time that we're all plugged in. 
off and on, but we continue doing this because it's great fun, at least I think. And I think we should develop it further. Let's see. 